Greetings. I'm Dr. Robert Brown, Chair of the Division of Stroke and Cerebrovascular Disease at Mayo Clinic. During today's discussion, we'll be talking about stroke and endovascular therapy. I'm joined by my colleagues, Dr. Alejandro Ravenstein, David Kalmus, and Giuseppe Lanzino, who are specialists in this area. Welcome. Several recently published studies have demonstrated the effectiveness of endovascular therapy for acute ischemic stroke. Can you provide a general summary of these studies and what we have learned? Dr. Ravenstein? That is correct. Uh, last year, uh, we were happy to see the publication of uh, five different uh, randomized controlled trials comparing conventional treatment of acute ischemic stroke, which could include intravenous thrombolysis versus acute endovascular therapy, primarily through mechanical thrombectomy using new devices called retrievable stents, which are more effective in achieving recanalization and reperfusion of uh, major intracranial vessels. And the results of these five trials were consistently very positive. Uh, in essence, they demonstrated that acute endovascular therapy is very effective in improving functional outcomes in patients with major acute ischemic stroke. The um, magnitude of the benefit was uh, variable across the trials, but uh, very convincing throughout. Um, to summarize uh, those outcomes, one can say that uh, uh, the mm, proportion of patients that achieved uh, functional independence at 90 days varied between one-third and 71% of uh, the patients treated endovascularly. And that goes, uh, uh, that results in a number necessary to treat between three and seven, which is, uh, one could say, spectacularly good. And uh, uh, this was compared against uh, patients that could have received uh, intravenous thrombolysis. Now, one has to take into account that not every acute stroke patient is a candidate for endovascular therapy. Uh, the uh, good candidates are adult patients who have good pre-stroke function and who present uh, with uh, disabling, de uh, disabling neurological deficits from a proximal intracranial vessel occlusion and do not have any extensive uh, acute ischemic changes on the head CT scan. Uh, time is also essential. Uh, the uh, benefit was uh, greatest uh, when the treatment, uh, the endovascular treatment, could be initiated within six hours of symptom onset. Um, there, is, uh, uh, there was some variation across trials in regards to the uh, method of identification of uh, uh, the best patients or the patients that could be uh, randomized, uh, uh, but, uh, but overall, uh, this uh, substantial benefit uh, achieved by uh, endovascular therapy in these trials has been a game changer in practice. Thank you. Dr. Kalmas, Dr. Ravenstein did allude to a certain extent to those patients that might be selected for this therapy. From your standpoint, what are the key factors in selecting patients who would be optimal candidates based on the data from these clinical trials? Yeah, he, he hit the high point, but I would say that in similar to uh, acute MI, where time is of the essence, uh, time is brain. And so among the three, the three major factors he talked about, time since onset, uh, uh, degree of neurological deficit, and changes on CT scan, we've always got to focus on time. We are in a, a, uh, a non-hurried rush to get the patient to the angiogram table, get the catheter in the artery, and get the clot out. And there have been uh, post hoc analyses from these same studies showing that even 15 minutes, even 15 minutes can, can uh, yield uh, substantial changes in outcome. So time of onset is key. Get the patient to the angio table as soon as possible. Secondly, degree of neurological deficit. While some of the trials allowed NIH stroke scale of just two, um, generally to be a more disabling NIH stroke scale, eight, nine, or higher that we want to target for endovascular therapy. And last, we want to look very carefully, look very carefully 
at the just the plain old-fashioned 1980s non-contrast CT scan to look for subtle changes that suggest irreversible injury. We have a scale of 0 to 10 called the aspect scale and if the patient's score is 6 or above that means they have sufficient probable salvable, salvable, salvageable tissue to be a candidate for endovascular therapy. So time, degree of neurological deficit, and findings on old-fashioned plain CT scan. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Evanstein, I would ask you as well, how have these studies changed the early evaluation and management of acute ischemic stroke? And in particular, what imaging studies can be used in the emergency room setting to guide the next step in therapy? Dr. Kelmus alluded to a CT scan without contrast, which has been in place for many, many years. Are there other imaging strategies that you and colleagues have found to be helpful as well? Yes, and uh, some uh, the, the, the trials actually require the use of a CT angiogram to select candidates. Uh, trials before uh, these uh, five positive trials uh, have uh, randomized patients uh, uh, without uh, proof that uh, they had uh, a proximal intracranial vessel occlusion. Uh, in these trials, uh, there was a requirement that the CT angiogram be conducted, and uh, it, it had to prove that there was an occlusion in the uh, supraclinoid, uh, most uh, distal portion of the uh, intracranial internal carotid artery, or the proximal segments of the middle cerebral artery. Uh, furthermore, uh, the same CT angiogram can be used to evaluate to some degree the collateral flow which uh, is very important in maintaining viability of the brain tissue when there is a proximal occlusion. Alternatively, uh, another trial uh, and many centers across uh, the US and uh, uh, other parts of the world uh, use uh, perfusion scans, uh, either CT perfusion or MRI diffusion perfusion to determine uh, the mismatch between the uh, core of the infarction that is presumably uh, impossible to salvage uh, versus the total area of hypoperfusion, the difference between these two being the penumbra or salvageable tissue. Uh, the big question at uh, this point is uh, whether uh, doing this type of uh, advanced uh, imaging scans uh, is a, uh, a measure that uh, it can improve patient selection enough to uh, account for the extra time that is required for their performance. Very good. Thank you. Now, how should a medical center approach care of acute ischemic stroke, and in particular uh, imaging and endovascular therapies, if they're not available due to, in great part, rural location of that hospital? Well, I think that uh, that may depend on, uh, on each center and the logistics of uh, each region, but uh, we have three types of uh, places where acute, ca acute stroke can be treated, stroke-ready centers, uh, where uh, intravenous thrombolysis can be uh, administered, but the patients then have to be transferred out uh, for uh, additional post-thrombolysis care primary stroke centers uh, that can administer intravenous thrombolysis and keep the patients for post-thrombolysis care, and then the comprehensive stroke centers such as ours where uh, patients can receive both uh, intravenous thrombolysis, all the subsequent medical treatment, and endovascular stroke therapy. The uh, a, a current practice is that the patients are triaged to uh, the nearest hospital where they can receive intravenous thrombolysis if uh, the patients are suspected to have an acute ischemic stroke and they can ar uh, arrive to the emergency department uh, so that uh, they can uh, receive intravenous thrombolysis within the accepted window of 4.5 hours from symptom onset. And from there, uh, the rest of the evaluation can proceed. Uh, the stroke-ready hospitals typically do not have CT angiogram or additional imaging capabilities. In those cases, we rely on uh, the clinical syndrome and decide uh, where the patient should be transferred, whether to a primary stroke center or to a comprehensive stroke center. Alternatively, if the patients are in a primary stroke center, we have the option of confirming the presence of an intracranial, uh, a proximal intracranial vessel occlusion amenable to endovascular therapy. In such cases, we proceed with uh, uh, a CT angiogram uh, before uh, deciding on the transfer. If the CT angiogram 
confirms the presence of a proximal intracranial vessel occlusion, the patient gets transferred to a comprehensive stroke center. Otherwise, the patient can stay in the primary stroke center. Thank you. And it's uh, likely the case, too, that many hospitals in a rural area now have a connection with a larger medical center via telestroke mm -hmm. that can provide an audio-video connection between the tertiary medical center, that is a comprehensive uh, stroke center, and the rural hospital so as to assist with that acute care. And that's very true. Mm -hmm. But Dr. Lanzino, from your standpoint, as one of the colleagues who performs this procedure, what are some of the key issues you face in using this procedure for acute ischemic stroke? Well, I think that the two main uh, key issues are related to time to revascularization and uh, uh, selection of patients. Uh, time to revascularization, as Dr. Combs stressed, is uh, extremely important to go fast. So it's important that uh, there is uh, a full team uh, able to be mobilized within uh, a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, that uh, often uh, requires a complete uh, culture change to what has been traditionally the care of patients with um, acute ischemic stroke. The other factor that has also been alluded before is uh, selection of the correct patients. So despite all advances in uh, imaging, uh, we still uh, are not uh, um, completely sure about uh, what is the maximum time window uh, to perform these uh, procedures. And uh, um, we don't want to exclude patients that um, could potentially benefit from the treatment, but at the same time, uh, we need to utilize uh, uh, resources so that uh, ideally only those patients that can benefit from this uh, expensive and uh, resource-consuming uh, procedures uh, um, are uh, effective. So I think those are uh, the two main areas where we um, can uh, and should continue trying to improve. And as far as uh, uh, time to revascularization, uh, we have uh, improved a lot. But uh, any, um, any minimal uh, change that will allow to gain even a, uh, a few minutes, as uh, Dr. Combs mentioned, it's uh, critical to maximize the benefit of the procedure. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Ravenstein alluded earlier to the remarkable effectiveness of this procedure in acute ischemic stroke. But we also recognize that any procedure can have complications associated with it as well. And can you comment, I'll ask both you and Dr. Kalmus to comment, again, as colleagues who perform this procedure, what are some of the complications that are both alluded to in the clinical trials that were published and experienced? What are the things that you most worry about? Well, the um, main complication is the issue of reperfusion uh, uh, hemorrhage. Uh, as there is uh, always uh, an established core that is already infarcted in these patients. and. Uh, revascularization of that established core in a patient that has all often received uh, thrombolytics uh, as a risk of um, reperfusion hemorrhage, which is to some extent is a complication that is uh, uh, almost uh, random. And uh, uh, besides trying to control patients' blood pressure within certain limits, there is very little that can be done to prevent uh, that complication. Um, Hemorrhage can also result uh, from a vessel perforation uh, during some of these procedures, but that uh, is uh, fairly rare uh, today given advances in imaging and the uh, microcatheter techniques. The other main uh, uh, neurological complication is uh, distal emboli. As you try to um, retrieve the embolus, quite often uh, the clot uh, fragments into smaller uh, smaller pieces that uh, can embolize downstream and um, despite us trying to uh, prevent that, uh, quite often we do this procedure with the balloon uh, inflated proximally to arrest flow and try to prevent this complication. There is uh, not uh, um, infrequently some degree of uh, distal microemboli that um, uh, obstruct uh, smaller vessels. So I would say those are the two main complications, but uh, uh, likely uh, with uh, improvement in technology and better understanding of uh, 
the disease and the more experience, uh, these complications are relatively infrequent. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kalmus, anything else you want to I would only to reiterate to, to, to take um, a, another look at the, the distal emboli. You can also, unfortunately, uh, as you're pulling back clot, you can send a piece of clot to a new territory. Mm -hmm. Let's say your primary clot is in the MCA. As you're pulling back, it breaks off and goes to the ACA, INT, infarcting territory, which can be pretty bad because now you're infarcting territory that wasn't already at risk. Yes. In fact, some of the new trials are looking at INT as a primary outcome, and some of the new devices that are being designed are being designed with, with uh, avoiding infarcting new territory as a primary, uh, a primary aim. Okay, very good, thank you. Can you comment as well in practice, both in the U.S. and really throughout the world, now that these procedures are increasingly utilized for acute ischemic stroke, who is performing these procedures in general? both in the U.S. And, and beyond. What specialty groups are performing these procedures? Well, I, I think that uh, the specialty group, at this stage, the specialty groups involved with the procedures has a lot to do with uh, uh, local, uh, regional uh, uh, organizations and logistics rather than uh, a planned uh, uh, national uh, effort that uh, I think ideally is what we should uh, um, be looking at and um, there are some uh, 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 required standards to perform these uh, procedures but uh, um, we don't have yet uh, a well-organized plan to make sure that uh, uh, different specialists performing the procedures uh, are uh, um, equally prepared uh, to be able to do uh, both safely and um, effectively. Uh, because of uh, uh, traditionally um, interventional neuroradiologists um, and uh, more recently neurosurgeons and neurologists have been involved with these procedures uh, and they have ex a lot of experience in the catheterization of the distal intracranial circulation. The vast majority of these procedures are done by these specialty groups, but there are uh, other specialists like uh, peripheral interventional radiologists and uh, cardiologists uh, that uh, are uh, also performing in uh, some areas. Very good, thank you. Now as we finish up, I just had one additional question if I may, and we've talked a lot today about endovascular therapies for acute ischemic stroke, particularly in the carotid distribution, internal carotid artery, middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery. Any additional factors that you would like to add regarding posterior circulation, that is basal artery thrombosis, and our approach in that scenario? Certainly, um, while true that uh, patients with uh, virtual vascular occlusions were not uh, included in the trials that we mentioned before, uh, they have been the vessels that have been historically uh, the uh, most uh, uh, not favorable, but uh, the most often targeted by endovascular therapy simply because medical therapy in those cases uh, often fails, but also because when medical therapy fails, uh, the prognosis is so ominous. So the attempt at uh, opening those blood vessels uh, with uh, catheter-based therapies started uh, decades ago. And uh, these trials should not change that. If anything, uh, the advent of uh, better uh, recanalization techniques uh, should make us uh, more, more aggressive with the management of uh, posterior circulation occlusions uh, by endovascular means. Very good, thank you. And Dr. Kalmas, any additional thoughts? Well, on yeah, that? to compare and contrast anterior versus posterior circulation uh, uh, occlusions, we're much more aggressive in terms of a time window in the posterior circulation and the anterior circulation going up to 24 hours or more since time of onset is, is not unusual. And in terms of being aggressive to get the clot out, um, we will work a little harder to, to, to revascularize given the, the dismal outcomes uh, without revascularization. Thank you, very good. Well, I'd like to thank my colleagues for their insights on this topic and thank you all for joining us on theheart.org on Medscape.